I would like for us to take a journey back again to the Old Testament today. Not as far back as we went this morning in the study of Abraham, but into the time of the Judges. And we'll be looking at Judges 6 and 7. I would remind us again the value of the Old Testament to us who serve Jesus Christ in His church when it comes to teaching object lessons. Let's all remember that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Whether a person was living in the patriarchal age or the mosaical dispensation, or in the Christian age, which we are living in today. Let us also remember that under every one of these ages, there were people whose faith was put to the test. Now, when their faith is put to the test, the kind of test that they're put to means that they are doing whatever God said simply and only because God said it. There's no visible connection between the thing that is commanded and the logical approach we would to many things that you're rewarded because you do it. It's just simply you do it because God's God and you know God said it. It's seen in the matter of being baptized in the very plan of salvation. There's no reasonable attitude or approach that would say you're immersed in water and God in his mind erases all your previous sins. What is the connection? Except that. God said so. And thus when you look around you, every religious group that claims God is Father, the Bible is the Word of God, and Jesus is Savior will have some form of belief or repentance and confession. They understand that because everything you do in life requires some kind of mental belief in it. They can see that. They can see also that if you turn from one course to another course, then there's a complete change of things. That's repentance. They understand that if you quit one job for a better job, you have to turn from one to the other. That's true in every avenue of life. And the same thing's true with confession. If you do this thing, you're willing to confess that you did it or that you're going to do it. But the rub comes when it comes to baptism and the plan of salvation. And people will ask questions like, well, I think God could save me without being baptized in some other way. Well, that's not the point. The point is, what does God tell you in His Word as to where He will save you? Thus, baptism is obeyed because God said, do it. That's where I will save you from your sins. Because all sins are against God. And in God's mind, it's where forgiveness takes place. Based upon our faithful compliance with His will. Now you hold that in mind and we come down to the time of the judges. I would not have liked to have lived during the days of the judges. There's a lot of times in history I wouldn't like to have lived. <laughs> Some much more so than others. And this is one of those times because in Israel... They were constantly violating God's law. God would allow barbaric people, pagans, to come in and punish them. And while they were there punishing them, they really punished them. Then the people's heart would turn back to God. They would cry out for mercy and for deliverance. And God then would send a judge. And he would deliver them. Or, as in the case just before chapter 6 of Joshua, you find even... Women sometimes called in to be a part of that deliverance. But when we come into chapter 6, we find Israel in one of those states that's caused God to punish them. Listen how it begins. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Sin always demands punishment. It always will be punished. Let me focus in on something that will come later to show you a point here. You'll remember that when David committed his sin regarding Bathsheba and all the attendant evils, that God said, I'm forgiving you of this sin. Thou shalt not die. 
Yet when the baby of that adulterous union was born, it did die. Now what's interesting about that is David was forgiven. Now mark this, but the baby died. David was forgiven, but the baby died. Sin always demands punishment. And then when you follow on through David's life, sin, sin was always involved in his house. There was no rest in David's house. And so it is that sin is as, well, I've said it many times before, oh, that God would grant us the view of sin that he has. And thus, when we look at Israel of old today, we're being helped to understand that when you sin, you must suffer for it. God's not going to bless you. You must be punished. And even as David, you can be forgiven of the sin, but the punishment still comes. So they've done evil, and God's delivered them into the hand of Midian seven long years. And you have then verse 2, And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Things are in terrible shape. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents. They came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. Now notice the impact upon Israel. Now this is brought on because of Israel's rebellion, their sin. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. But what happened? And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And that's the story of the time of the judges. It's just different people at different times. Notice beginning in verse 7. And it came to pass that the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites. That the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. If you go back to the time of Moses as he re, as he gives what we have as an account of the matter in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy meaning a restatement of the law by him just before Joshua takes over, before the death of, of Moses, and they begin the conquest of the land. Moses even says, now I'm going to tell you this, you're going to agree to it, but you're going to disobey God anyway. And here we see it going, moving along. Now there comes an angel of the Lord and said unto the oak which was at Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the Abizrite, and his son, and here we introduce to the judge, is going to be Gideon, threshing wheat by the wine press. And notice how bad off they are to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now I really have wondered at times, this man. Does he know at this time that he's a mighty man of valor? I doubt he does from what we're going to see later on before we ever get to where he drives out the people that are persecuting them. But God can look at a man because he knows all things and see the possibilities that he doesn't even see about himself. All that Gideon is going to have to do is stay true to God's word. And he'll learn things about himself he never knew. But God knew. And he will accomplish things he never thought about accomplishing. 
but God knew he could. And this is the way he's approached by the angel. Thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And you can tell he's learned in the things of his people because he said, And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us of the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? This is a commission of this particular man for him to use himself to do this. Now that automatically implies, as I've said earlier, that God knew about, more about that man than he knew about himself. Or he wouldn't have chosen him. If we will be true to God's word, if we will use every fiber of our being to know and do the truth, God can use us in ways that we can't even begin to realize in the service of the Master. But if we live our lives trying to figure out how to be happy here without God, then we're not fitting ourselves for service in the kingdom. Obviously, God knew the caliber man that Gideon was, and we have it recorded for us, written for our learning, to help us be as we ought to be in the kingdom of the Lord today. And then notice what he says. O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? How am I going to do it? Well, the answer is you're not going to do it by yourself. Just forget that. And we too need to remember that. If we think we can do what God has called us to do on our own, without His guidance, without compliance with His will from the heart, you're not going to be able to do it. Behold, my family's poor in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. He knew in and of himself as to what they possessed. How are we going to raise an army like this? But never forget God can do what seems and is impossible to us. The Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. Think about it, folks. Are there any words that can give you greater comfort than the words from God that I will be with thee. And thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Now people of this world will say, well, how are you going to do that? I can't see how I can do that. I just don't understand why it's going this way. I just can't see why this has to happen this way. Well, you know, he never asked you to see that. He never asked you to do what you could not do. He just said, follow me. Do what I tell you to do. I can do what you can't do. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace, favor in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. You can see the humanity of Gideon coming out here. You can see he's like any other person. Again, he doesn't know what he really can do. Now notice he's not trying to get out from under what he was told he could do. He's still a mighty man of valor. He just doesn't really know it yet. But he is asking, will you prove to me that this is really happening? That you are with me? That you will give me the wherewithal that I don't possess and none of us possess to get the job done? So we'll skip over that a ways because there are a number of signs that were done. We won't take time just to read the scripture to you. But this brings this out. God does not just ask us or command us to do certain things except that he proves that he's the one that gave the orders and he was, he's able to do it. Look anywhere in the Bible that you want to. And when God asks somebody to do something, he always gives them the wherewithal to know that God commanded it and that he can do what he said you need to have in order to perform this thing. Now, he tells him to go ahead and make a long story short, to overthrow the 
statue of Baal, the idol Baal, that belonged to his father. And in those days, they went up on a high place, had a grove of trees, and in the midst of that, that would be the worship place. That was typical of all these idolatrous people. Well, his own father has one of those. A lot of these people believed in God, but they also tried to incorporate the pagan gods round about them. So he does what he's commanded to. And then in time, we see, after he makes an offering, he actually overthrows Baal, and he, on the altar he offers up a bullock to God. This sets everybody off. All of the people round about find out it's Gideon that's done this, and they're going to put him to death. And this is what you read about through the rest of the chapter. When we come to verse 33, then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. I guess we have to explain something about pitched in the valley of Jezreel. They weren't playing baseball. Pitch means you pitch a tent. I don't know if anybody even knows that you pitch a tent. That's the proper way to say that. Most of the time we say put it up, but that's what is meant. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Well, well, God is going to supply him what he doesn't have to be able to do what he commissioned him to do. He blew a trumpet, and the Baezer was gathered after him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered after him, and he sent messengers into Asher, to the Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt have Israel, save Israel, by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. Do you see the humanity of the man still saying, keep telling me, keep giving me a sign that you are with me. And God helps him each time. And it was so. For he rose up early in the morning and thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleece and a bowl, a bowl full of water. Now notice, and Gideon said unto God, he knows he's pushing his luck as we would say today. Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece and upon all the ground. Let there be dew. God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. What may we gather from this that can help us be better servants of God? Well, one of the things is how long-suffering God is with us. And the other thing, what he's willing to do for us who are weak in showing us the wherewithal he has to, so that we may accomplish what he's asked us or commanded us to do. Well, he's got a name now when you come into chapter 7 because he did that with his father's idol, overthrew it, dealt with the people. He showed he was not fearful of them. He did what God told him to do. He's now known as Jerubbaal. Notice, then Jerubbaal, who is Gideon. All the people with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Horod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moreth and the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. You know, I get things on the Internet from time to time, Facebook, uh, emails, whatever, that's trying to tell all these denominational people how to fill the building up with people. And here in this Old Testament lesson, an example written for your learning and mine, he said, you got too many people. Why is that in your Bible? Now, therefore, in the light of that fact, significance of therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And they returned of the people 22,000 
and there remained 10,000 and the elders got together, fired the preacher, said, you run them off. May I remind you God ordered this? And he said, you're not going to accomplish this thing so that you can say, we did it by our own strength. You're going to accomplish this thing because you're going to know it couldn't be accomplished except by me. There'll be no doubt that I did it. There'll be no doubt that by yourself you couldn't do it. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Well, we heard that once. All right. Bring them down to the water and I will try them. I will put them to the test. For thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. And he brought down the people under the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink, and the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that I lap, that lapped will I save you. Notice, by the 300 men, who will save them? By the 300 men, God says, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand and let all the other people go every man to his own place. Notice in this that he got rid of the fearful first. Have you ever noticed in Revelation 21, 8 that some who have an assigned place in hell are the fearful? There are people who will not do what they know the Bible says, confessing it is from God because they're afraid. And the Lord doesn't look too lightly on that because if you look in Revelation 21.8, those that were fearful are listed right alongside of those who are liars and others. John will teach you that perfect love casteth out all fear. What does that mean? Perfect love is a love that obeys God and takes Him at His word and acts only on His authority. It's not talking about you don't need to grow in faith. Although it's an interesting thing to study what it means to grow in faith. But it means your, your faith is not what it ought to be until it takes God at His word and obeys it. That's the faith that's with works and is not dead of James chapter 2. So the people took victuals in their hand and their trumpets and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man into his tent, and retained those 300 men. And the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. 300 men. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down into the host, for I, now notice this, past tense, already done, for I have delivered it into thine hand. There was never a doubt that God was going to do on his part what he was going to do. It was already done. The point is, how do you show your faith in me that I can do it in the way I've commanded you to do it? No problem with God. Problem is, your faith's being proved. Your faith is being tested. Beloved brethren, Sometimes you think you know people until the test comes and their real character shows up. Whoops, I thought about that sermon on profanity. I may not hit that too, too hard. Now, if you didn't hear that, you have to go back and listen to it. Because one preacher hit like that and scared everybody and a curse word came out of a member's mouth. And I would say they were proved. Tried and tested. Weighed the balances. In that case, found warning. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Purah, thy servant, down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say. And afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down into the host. Notice thy hands will be strengthened. You need strength? Who doesn't, brethren? In the army of the Lord today, the church of the living God, each one of us as soldiers of the cross need to be strengthened. Will we let God strengthen us? 
or are we going to fight about the way he does it? And thou shalt hear what they say. In other words, slip up to them. Listen to what's going on. Then when he down with Pura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. Now, 300 men. God whittled them down. And now watch verse 12. And the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number, as the sand by the seaside for multitude. I imagine that 300 got smaller all along if they're trusting in themselves. When you trust in yourself, when you try to work things out as a human being, then there's so many mountains you can't climb. So many works you can't do. Because you're not trusting in God and His Word. You're not living by faith. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came into a tent and smote it, that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay along. Well, how could a cake of barley bread do that? Well, how could 300 accomplish what God's told them they could accomplish? And this fellow answered and said, This is nothing else, say the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so. When Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and returned unto the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Notice again, past tense, already delivered. Well, they haven't even attacked yet. What does this tell you about the growth of his faith in God and his system? He's now speaking as God spoke. It's already done. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put a trumpet in every man's hand and with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that. As I do, so shall ye do. Well, think about that for a minute. He's so close to God now in his faith in God and God's system of saving them from the Midianites that he says, Well, it sounds like Paul. Follow me. As you see Christ living in me. When I blow with the trumpet and I, uh, I and all that are with me. Then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp. And say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him. Came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers. They were their hands. Now this gets interesting. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the hosts ran and cried and fled. They're scared to death. And what goes on? And the 300 blew the trumpets. It goes on and on. And the Lord, here's what they didn't count on. They're in the dark, they camp, they've caught them by surprise. They're not anticipating this. They look on Israel as a very beaten down poor people. And what do they end up doing? They're so confused. The Lord said, every man sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shittah in Zeriath and to the border of Abel Mehobah unto Tabath. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. You see, by their action, it caused strength to build up in the other people. And when they saw the whole thing, then all of Israel comes out. And that reminds me of Esther. Where her uncle told her, who knows what the house come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Remember how God approached Gideon, thou mighty man of valor well it took a great deal of trust in God and his way of saving them to do this because no general would have done what he did no one could have thought it would work but they left out God and his wisdom and someone having an obedient faith in God and the wisdom of God 
Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. And they slew Oreb upon the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian through the, and, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. Well, the impossible was done, but not according to man's wisdom, not according to man's viewpoint, not according to the way West Point said you could accomplish it. It was done because of pure, obedient faith in God. Remember, God says, people are too many for me to save them, lest you think you did it by your own faith. Is that in your Bible? Yes, it is. Why is it in your Bible? The Holy Spirit tells us whatsoever things are written for time were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Patience, remember, in the New Testament is bearing up under the burdens while God does what He's doing. We want things to be done in a certain way at a certain time according to the way we think they ought to be done. It doesn't work that way. And Paul said, for we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Do you want to see a perfect example of a person walking by faith? And since faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, thus he's walking as the word of God leads, guides, and directs him. Just remember Gideon. That mighty man of valor remembering and you will as you go through the Old Testament looking at every one of these men that are selected and what women were selected too to be mighty people of faith examples for each one of us as we serve God here and you'll see it works that way remember David just a stripling goes down to see how the battle goes he takes food to his brothers and he says, what is going on here? This giant comes out and says, send your champion out and fight. Nobody, everybody peeps out from under the tent flap. His brothers even malign him and say, you just come to spy out the thing. Well, what was going on in David's head? I kept my father's sheep and a bear came. And God delivered him into my hands and protected those sheep. I kept my father's sheep, and a lion came, and he delivered him into my hands. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You notice how simple that is? But Saul didn't have it. Nobody in the army of Israel had it. And nobody even in David's own family had it. But David did. And thus down through the ages, Gideon and people like David shine as a spotlight, a beacon as to what it is to be faithful to the Lord and let him have his way with thee. In the only way that's possible, knowing his will and doing it and being patient, bearing up under the burden while he works in his own way. You will have strength you know not of if you will just comply with his will. You remove from your mind those things that trouble you. He will just know that God knows what he's doing. Trust him. Stay true to the book and follow along and not try to run ahead. If you're not a child of God this, this afternoon, you can be before you leave. We've studied what to do in the beginning of this sermon for you to become a Christian like you read of in the New Testament, a member of the Lord's church. Now we've studied what one ought to have on his mind all the days of his life, what it is to be faithful, and even when your faith is put to the test, how to pass the test. So I've given you the answer book. When the test comes, you've already got the answers. God saw fit to that because I just read it from his book, and it's there to teach us. But if as a child of God you've sinned, we urge you to repent of your sins, come confessing them, and pray God for forgiveness. And now do that if you need while we stand and sing.